Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Hydrogen and Fuel Cells Europe here at the Hanover Messe 2023 at the technical forum today. Please have a seat, have a drink. The drinks are on the house. The hostesses are here to uh, help you to a nice coffee, an orange juice, or uh, whatever you'd like. We have a very interesting talk coming up uh, for you today. I've been hearing a lot lately about rare materials, not only in batteries, but also in fuel cells. They can be a bit of an issue. So Mr. Wayne Thornhill, sales manager at Ames Goldsmith Semig, he will tell you all about ultra-low iridium anode catalyst for PEM electrolysis. Please, please give Thor <coughs> Wayne an a round of applause. Good morning, Hanover. Uh, yeah, thank you for coming today. Um, yeah, I'd like to um, talk today about some of our development work we've been doing on uh, reduced iridium catalysts for uh, PEM electrolysis. Um, yeah, we've not got much time today, so I'll, I'm going to rattle through this. So if you've got any questions, if you can hold them to the end or come and see us on our stand in Hall 13 E08, that would be great. Um, so yeah, I'm Wayne Thornhill. I'm the sales manager for uh, Ames Goldsmith KMIG. Um, so I'll first of all introduce the company to you, our existing range, and then the development work we've been working on at the moment. So Ames Goldsmith's part of the Ames Goldsmith Group. Um, it's not a household name, but we are um, a large precious metal um, chemistry specialist. So we're probably the biggest name in silver technology. Uh, we've got several sites around the world, mainly focused in North America and the UK, uh, but we've also got divisions in Taiwan for the refinery of silver, uh, sales offices in Tokyo and distribution around the world. Um, so yeah, so we've got um, uh, core values around social responsibility, quality, innovation, uh, and our vision statement is performance materials for a bright future. So the core product of the company is around silver. Uh, it's uh, electronic materials, silver nitrate, silver oxide. But in terms of the hydrogen economy, we have two, three divisions that look at uh, PGM metals. So we have production in the UK and the US. Uh, we produce at scale. Uh, so in terms of iridium, we can produce iridium oxide and our special iridium ruthenium oxide at a level of around about 500 kilograms per annum. Uh, we're also producing platinum on carbons at scale in New Jersey. Um, so yeah, our divisions are UK and in Dundee, which is the KMIG site. Uh, so we have our own in-house electrochemical testing facilities, um, and we have very good ISO accreditation. So yeah, we have a dedicated range for the, uh, for the proton exchange membrane. So we have uh, everything branded under the name Hyper. Um, so we have a dedicated range for the fuel cell and a dedicated range for the electrolyzer. So in terms of the hydrogen economy, we are working uh, in uh, hydrogen production, particularly around proton exchange membrane. Uh, for the fuel cell, we are providing the platinum and carbon, and now we are looking for syngas and e-fuel uh, production, working with a number of different companies. So in terms of the fuel cell products, we have a, a dedicated range, uh, ranging from 20 to 70% platinum loaded on uh, a number of different carbons. Um, these are relatively new to the market, being launched last year at the Hanover Fair last, uh, in 2022, um, and they've been designed to have high durability. And this can be seen here when we compare it to a competitor product. Um, so the uh, ECSA of the competitor product you can see drops off quite quickly, whereas ours has been designed to retain that electrochemical performance for, for much longer. In terms of the uh, electrolyzer catalysts, um, as I say, we, we've been providing these products for a number of years now. We've been a pretty big name for, uh, for PEM electrolysis for a while now. Our biggest selling product is iridium ruthenium oxide. Um, so yeah, this is produced at scale. It's been used in deployments of 10 megawatt, and it's got a history of in-field in use of about 15 years. So it's a very well-proven product. Uh, in terms of performance, it's comparable in terms of a, uh, in terms of a polarization curve to an iridium oxide. So uh, you get the benefits of that, but with a much reduced um, iridium content. Um, primarily designed to increase the durability of, um, of the iridium. Um, 
most people are a little bit concerned about ruthenium di uh, dissolution, but with this product, it's an alloy of the two metals. So you can see the overlay in the TEM, TEM image. Um, all the metals are perfectly overlaid, showing, um, showing very good alloying. So we, we don't particularly get ruthenium dissolution with this product. So yeah, we, we make this at scale. It's our biggest selling product, um, and it's a very good way for, for um, companies to reduce their iridium demand now. Um, so yeah, all the products we've just spoken about, there are standard grades, um, they're available at scale, and if anyone's interested, then come and talk to us. What I'll move on to now is what we're doing development-wise. So we all know there's a reason that why we use iridium in, this, in the PEM system. Um, the PEM system anode has particularly high current densities, which increase oxidation. Uh, it's very low pH, so iridium is one of the most durable um, elements around. Um, let me just take a drink. Yeah, so it's one of the most durable elements around, and it also has high catalytic activity, so that's why it's used in the system. But as we're all aware, there, are, there is a big push for electrolysis globally. There are over 30 countries that have signed um, declarations stating that they're going to move to, uh, to carbon neutral by 2050, um, and a lot of these countries are putting in place policies around electrolysis. So in terms of uh, electrolysis going forward, there are projections, uh, this one from the IEA saying that by 2030 there will be 100 gigawatts of electrolysis um, deployed globally, and then by 2050 that will increase to over 3,500 gigawatts. The general consensus is that proton exchange is going to be about 40% of that market, so in terms of, of, of proton exchange, that means we need 40 gigawatts deployed by 2030 and over 1,400 gigawatts deployed by, by 2050. So lots of papers, you'll see people reporting very high loadings of iridium, maybe as high as 1 to 2.5 uh, grams per kilowatt. Um, these are obviously high compared to like industry standard, but if we take the lower end of those projections, then you can see that that means for a gigawatt, we need approximately one ton of iridium. And by 20, 2050, we're talking 1,400 tons of iridium, which I don't think anybody thinks is realistic or achievable. And that's because there's only around about eight tons of iridium mined per annum. Um, so, Using our technology, our current state-of-the-art technology, the iridium ruthenium oxide, we see a drastic reduction in that demand. So industry is actually using around about 0.2 to 0.3 grams of iridium per kilowatt. And with that, that, that makes it much more viable to get to like the 2030s, the 2040s with this type of technology. So you can see the reduction in iridium demand from something like that one gram per kilowatt. But still, when we look at those 2050 numbers, this is still not going to be enough to achieve what we need to get to for, for that time period. So what can we do development-wise to, um, to move this forward? So obviously, we're already looking at an alloy. That's our biggest selling product, and there's more optimization that can be done there. There are further things we can do to reduce the iridium demand through alloying, and that is something we're working on. But the logical step is to move towards a supported product. So. We see there are already commercially available supported iridium grades on uh, non-conductive supports like titanium oxide. That's good. It's a benefit. Um, it'll certainly help with those numbers around 2030, you know, about around the years 2030 to 20, uh, 2040. It will certainly reduce the amount of iridium that's demanded. But what we really need to do is move towards a conductive support. And that's because the metal on the surface of the CCM is required to conduct electricity across the membrane. So if you use a non-conductive support, that doesn't contribute to the function of the catalyst. And it means that you still need a very heavy loading of iridium on the surface. So for us at Ames Goldsmith, we're trying to move to that 2050 level. And we've been dedicating our um, development to this uh, over the last two or three years. We've been screening lots and lots of different potential support materials which are both conductive and, and um, stable in the oxidizing conditions and low pH of the uh, electrolyzer system. So we have a number of different candidates, but what I'd like to speak to you about today is a product that we're, we're initially taking to the market as a first step to increase the confidence in the PEM um, market. So We've provisionally made a product which we're calling Hyper WE53S. 
Um, this product is approximately 13% iridium and it's being supported on a platinum based support. Uh, this support is fully conductive and stable in the conditions of the anode. Um, and it offers comparable current density and durability to something like iridium oxide or our iridium ruthenium oxide. So here you can see comparative polarization curve and also comparative accelerated stress tests. So this product, these tests were done by a third party independent um, university um, and they ran these um, tests to 10,000 cycles and the feedback we received was there was, they saw no reason why this product couldn't achieve 100,000 hours in commercial deployment. If we were able to adopt this product, if we were able to swap out all the iridium that's currently being used with a grade like this, it would do this to the iridium profile. So we would see that by 2050, we cumulatively only need about 86 tons of iridium, which is actually quite achievable with the eight ton that's being mined per year. We set out with this goal of, of overcoming this potential bottleneck, this perception that proton exchange membrane potentially has an issue due to the iridium availability. So we were not setting out to produce a cheap product. Uh, we were trying to overcome this technical obstacle. So that's one of the reasons we've gone with platinum. There are several reasons that are actually beneficial of going with this as a support. So first of all, it has a proven track record of being used in the anode. PTLs and flow plates are already treated with platinum because it's known that that's stable in the anode conditions. One of the biggest concerns that we find from our contacts with the mines is that there's a perception that, there's, um, that as platinum and palladium demand reduces through the removal of ice combustion engine cars, um, there's not going to be as much demand for platinum and palladium. Um, iridium is only 2 to 4% of the mining basket. So if no one's mining for platinum and palladium, no one's actually going to be mining for iridium either. They're not going to just mine for iridium. So by encouraging the use of platinum in the system, we actually encourage the mining of, of iridium and, and therefore sort of help to guarantee its future. And third of all, um, uh, the platinum potentially has the benefit to work as a recombination catalyst. Uh, on the anode side anyway, so that will reduce the need for putting platinum or in, in the membrane or dosing on the anode anyway. So whilst we weren't setting out to make a cheap product, obviously switching from iridium to a mainly platinum-based system um, does have a, a very beneficial impact on the PGM cost of the product uh, based on the current PGM prices. So if we would go from something like iridium black to iridium oxide to iridium ruthenium, we can see that we actually get a significant drop in the, in the price, the contribution of the price from, from, the, uh, from the PGMs. So that's one side of the picture. So we believe that, that using this type of technology, and, and again, this is a first iteration, it's very much still at the development stage. Um, there are future steps we can take to optimize and further improve this product. Um, but we are, we are talking to people, we are issuing samples at this moment for this product so it can be uh, analyzed in systems. Um, that's one side of the project. So the, the other side that we really need to focus on is the recycling, uh, particularly recycling of CCMs and MEAs. So currently, there are recycling loops for iridium and platinum. Um, these tend to be pyrometric. Um, they burn out the naphion, which is not great for the green profile of this technology. And then they recover the, the metal as metal sponge, which is not particularly useful for making catalysts, again, for going into these systems. So, yeah, we're developing a, a new process, which is going to be dedicated for the recycling of hydrogen uh, components. Um, this will involve the dissolving of naphion potentially for reuse um, and recovering metals in a salt form so they can readily be made uh, back into catalysts which will be useful. And then just to summarize, um, there is a paper that came out recently uh, which summarizes some of these points and, and sort of says you know if these sort of uh, points can be achieved then it does make PEM viable long term. So we feel like the work we're doing at the moment goes along with what this paper has said and, uh, and then therefore there's a very bright future for proton exchange membrane technology all the way through to 2050 and beyond. 
So with that, I'd like to finish. Um, we're, we are over in Hall 13, um, stand E08. So if anyone wants to follow up and come and discuss any of this with us, uh, I can take questions there. Um, we're also having, because we're from Scotland, we're also having a whiskey tasting in, uh, this afternoon at 4 p.m. and you're, you're all very welcome. So with that, I'd say thank you. Mm.